Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks so much for coming. It's, I really appreciate this is a really important night for me because, um, you know, I started off with the No Impact Project back in, geez, uh, November 2006. So to have, and there's so much has happened since then, so to have finally, like, be in a bookstore with a book is an incredible place for me to be. So thanks for coming. Um, I always think it's so funny when these, this introduction gets read because everybody's here like to talk about no impact man and the fact that our pl our planet is melting and they're like then they're like Colin Bevan is the author of you know Operation Jedberg about D Day and and uh, you know and fingerprints my other two books both history books I always think it's so funny t to hear the introduction of myself because you're like well what's that got to do with the environment <laughs> you know what does he know so. Um, and what happened to me was I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a writer by trade, and um, back and I had been writing obviously history books. And back in 2006, I started to read more and more. I just I actually we've known about global warming for 25 years, um, but uh, it wasn't until for me 2006 that I started to become really w aware of it, and I started reading about it in in, in the paper and. Um, and honestly, what one of the things that really got to me was these images of, of polar bears drowning as they swam to try to reach their food because they could no longer walk because there wasn't the ice to walk across. So that research vessels were actually starting to find uh, polar bear bo bodies in the middle of the ocean, um, polar bears who had drowned because there was no ice for, you know, and they had to swim hundreds of miles to get to their food. And at the same time, here I was in New York City, this media professional, and um, you know, supposedly me and all my friends had kind of achieved the American dream, if you want. We were living in, in you know, the great metropolis of, of the world, and in, in you know, an exciting industry, and yet everybody was um, running around too stressed to go to the grocery store to get decent food for their children, um, uh, were working all the hours, having money but not seeming happy. Um, so many, you know, to actually to the point where uh, so, so many people depressed to the point where we ha now have Prozac showing up in our drinking water because it's been excre excreted in our urine. Um, and at the same time, that's in a developed world. In the developing world, a, a billion people without access to clean drinking water. So, uh, so back in 2006, I'm reading about this global warming and and, and hearing that we're melting the planet, and, be, and I kept thinking to myself, it would be one thing if we were having a party. <laughs> if we could say to ourselves, like, we're wrecking the place, but we're having a great time doing it. And I just, I didn't feel that that was what was happening. I, f I, I felt that so many people were struggling to get by, and that self-same way of life that they were struggling with was also causing us a lot of troubles. And I, I couldn't write history anymore. And my initial, I, I, the, the subtitle of the book is Adventures of a Guilty Liberal, right? And why that was kind of important to me is because I, you know, I, I always had all these so-called liberal ideals, but my answer to most liberal, I, most of the, my answer to most world problems was to shake my finger at somebody, you know, to, or to point my finger at somebody. And um, at that particular time, um, the, uh, the people I was pointing my finger at was the previous uh, government administration here in the United States. And I was filled with venom and hatred. And actually, my wife, this is my wife, Michelle, by the way, sitting here in the front row, co-star of the documentary No Impact Man and co-star of my life. And, um, and, and she kept saying, you have missiles in your head. You're creating, you know, you may not like them, but as long as you're spewing hatred out into the world, you're creating missiles in your own head. And uh, she kind of through this conversation, I kind of realized that this and constant antagonism, this constant we hate them, they hate us kind of approach to to world affairs and to politics wasn't going to get us anywhere. It wasn't going to get me anywhere. It wasn't going to get, it was bad for me. It made me feel awful. But also, as long as we can keep considering that there's two sides, you know, that there's the them and there's the us, there's the progressives and the conservatives and never the twain shall meet, that, that we couldn't make any progress. And so I realized that, you know, a polemic, you know, writing some finger-wagging, hectoring polemic was not going to change anybody's mind. I wanted to write about this stuff, but it wasn't going to change my, anybody's mind. And it, 
That, that brings me, I'm just going to, I'm, 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 by the way, I, I don't want to talk too long. I really want to have a conversation. I want to take questions and, and chat, but um, I'm going to read a little bit from the book, too. And um, so, there's a Zen koan that captures the fix that I was in. As the koan goes, long ago in China, a stray cat wandered into Zen master Nam Chong's monastery. Sometimes the cat would cuddle up in the laps of the monks who lived in the East Residence, and sometimes in the laps of the monks who lived in the West Residence. Instead of taking the care of the cat together, the monks from the East and West Halls became jealous of each other. We love the cat more than you do, so it should live with us. No, we know how to take care of the cat better. It should stay with us. One day, the argument broke out in the middle of the Dharma room where the monks were supposed to be meditating. Finally, Zen master Nam Chong stormed into the room. He picked up the cat, held a knife to its throat, and said, You monks, give me one true word of love for this cat, and I'll save it. If you cannot, I will kill it. Nam Chong was testing the monks. Did any of them really love the cat? Or did they just want to win the argument? Were they willing to demonstrate real responsibility for its life? Or had they become too distracted by their fight for control of it? As the story goes, none of the monks said or did anything. They were all still trying to figure out how to prove the other side was wrong. So Nam Chan slit the cat's throat. What began to worry me was that I and the political system I participated in were a lot like those monks in the Dharma room when it came to the health of the planet. Never exerting much energy toward anything but winning the argument. Too rarely taking any real action. Forgetting that the proverbial cat's life was at stake while we argued over who owned it. So. Back then in 2006, what I was worried about is that the political system was in such a deadlock that um, there was nothing that was going to get changed. Um, also, I asked myself, like, why do I have to, why do I have to wait that for the government to tell me that I shouldn't be driving an SUV? Why can't I just not drive an SUV? And um, I wanted, so as I said, I wanted to turn my skills as a writer over to this subject, and and. Um, I was, uh, well, one day I came into the house and um, I discovered that uh, I had left both air conditioners on um, in order that the house would be cool when I got home. You see, I, I'm sure you understand, it's very important that we don't have to wait 20 minutes for the apartment to cool down. So I left the air conditioners on all day long. And in doing so, I, I, when I came in that particular day, because I'd been thinking about it and trying to figure out how to write about this issue in a way that pe people would pay attention to, I realized that I was part of the problem. And that m the way that I lived was causing the problem too. And, um, and that maybe I should worry more about changing myself than about changing other people. Maybe I should work on keeping my side of the street clean. Maybe, um, you know, as it says, you know, I'm. I like to borrow from all the re religious traditions, but maybe I should worry about the, 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 the log in my own eye before the speck in everybody else's eye. And then when I began to think about that, I thought, maybe if I really did do something about my lifestyle, maybe if I really did change my lifestyle, since I'm a storyteller also, maybe I could just tell the story about my own life and the changes that I made, and maybe people would pay attention, because I wouldn't be shaking my finger at anybody. I wouldn't be getting ang people angry at me before I even started. I would just be saying, this is what I'm doing in my life. Maybe it makes a good story you'd like to lead, read. And honestly, some people, I understood that some people would think I was you know, strange and that, that, it would, that it would be a sensation. But I, but I hoped that the sensation would cause enough interest in the issue that people would, would, would move beyond the story into the issues that I was discussing. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, the, the, obviously all of this is in book, but it will tell you that um, we went through a bunch of stages as a family. Um, that, you know, we kind of started by not making trash, then moved into only using um, transportation that didn't cause uh, carbon to be emitted, which means riding a bike. Um, local food because of the uh, damage caused by the transportation that the average piece of food moves over 1,500 miles from farm to plate.